Okay, Jesus' word. The scripture for today's sermon comes from John 16, 5 through 11. And the word of God speaks to us like this. But now I'm going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asks me, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. This is the very word of God to us. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Thanks, Joanna. You guys can be seated. And uh, as you do, let's pray and ask for Jesus' help. Um, Jesus, we thank you for small things like Bucky's, and uh, big things like your word. We're grateful for your word, Jesus. We pray that you would form and shape us through your word. I pray that where we are eager this morning to encounter you through your word, that you would meet with us. I pray that where we struggle to believe if your word is real or if you really do meet with people through your word, we we pray that you would meet with us in that way also. Jesus, thank you for your word. I pray that by your spirit, you would open our eyes and ears and hearts to see, understand, and be changed by you. It's in your name, Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, the year is 1997, and one of the best, worst movies ever is about to be released. It's not Titanic. Uh, It's not Good Will Hunting. It's not even Men in Black. The movie is Con Air. Yeah, see, I know, man. Lots of, lots of opinions about that movie. In that movie, if you're not familiar with it, Nicolas Cage uh, plays a ranger who gets back from Desert Storm, and he, like, I've got to, listen, he plays a ranger, quote unquote, he's wearing a beret, like a French pastry chef, and uh, anyway, he, like, does not do, he doesn't do, he doesn't do a great job, but in that movie, he's just gotten back from uh, Desert Storm, His wife is pregnant, and he goes to this bar to see her where she works. First night back, and he ends up getting in a fight, and uh, he goes to jail for 10 years. And Blake reminded me in this scene where the judge is sentencing him to jail. He says, like, dead serious, he's like, you're going to jail because your hands are lethal weapons. You know, they're registered as lethal weapons. So I was like, oh, man, I didn't know that about rangers. So congratulations. If you're in here, you're a ranger. Your hands are supposedly registered as lethal weapons. Hey, I remembered when I was thinking of this, too, the rangers changed from a black beret to a tan beret. Not ironically, I think after this movie was released. I think that was somewhere around 2000, was it not? I feel a bit like it was probably a reaction to Nicolas Cage wearing that black beret. Anyway, here's why I'm thinking of this song. Though the movie is take it or leave it, I don't know why. I have, I, like, I love Nicolas Cage, and I don't know why. He's not a good actor. Uh, but I like watch the movies, and I'm like, ah, Nicholas, you've done it again. My goodness, why do I love this so much? Um, movie's not great. However, uh, not open to argument is the fact that one of the best songs that's ever been written plays prominently in that movie by the amazing Miss Leanne Rhymes. Leanne Rhymes, the song is, here's the line. I so desperately want to sing it, but I know like everyone will get up and leave and Blake has banned me from singing while preaching ever. Um, the song goes, how do I get through one night without you? If I had to live without you, what kind of life would that be? And I know, as you're hearing this, you're like, my goodness, Bucky's, and now we're talking about Nicolas Cage. What in the world's going on? This song has been in my head, like rent-free, this entire week, because I've, I've been thinking about what the disciples of Jesus must have been feeling as they're facing this last night with Jesus, and Jesus keeps telling them, I'm going to leave, you're going to be alone, but, but not forever, I'm going to come back to you. And the disciples are, as you think about it, I mean, they are like, Jesus, how are we supposed to do this without you? 
How are we supposed to live without you? How are we supposed to face all that you're saying we're going to face? How are we supposed to do this without you? This is Thursday evening before Jesus would go to the cross, and he's telling them you're going to be persecuted. They're going to throw you out of synagogues. There are going to be people who are going to kill you thinking that they're doing me service, thinking that they're, that they're honoring God. And the disciples are like, how are we supposed to face any of this without you? And And then Jesus is going to say, guys, it's better for me or it's better for you if I go. And they just kind of are like facing this. How in the world are we supposed to make it without you? So here's where we find ourselves in John chapter 16. I want to read a few of these verses. Here's what Jesus says. Again, on this last night he'd have with his disciples. He says, I've told you these things. When he says these things, remember, he's just told them, you're going to bear witness about me. The Spirit is going to bear witness about me, but you're going to face persecution, opposition, and suffering as you do that. And he says, I've told you those things so that when their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asked me, where are you going? Yet because I've spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now, before we get to the meat of where we're headed in John 16, I just want to make a couple observations about these verses here before we get into the rest. Um, I want you to notice how Jesus sees his disciples. You notice that Jesus is like, hey, I, I see sorrow has filled your heart. Like he actually sees those things. He's, a, he's in tune with it. He knows. He's mindful of it. Jesus isn't saying, like, what's the matter with you guys? Why are you sorrowful? What's the matter? Just get through it. He, he doesn't do that. He doesn't miss what they're going through. He doesn't miss what they're experiencing. And I think a lot of times our concept of Jesus is that he's like, man, just get over it. There's people who have it worse than you do. So my son just started playing soccer. And, and one of the things that we talked about, and it's, it's helpful with, like, physical training and things like that. It's like one of the philosophies I want you to hang on to is someone is always sucking worse than you are. Somebody always has it worse. No matter how bad you feel like you're hurting as you're running, somebody has it worse and you need to think of that person and say, okay, I can go a little bit further. But that's not how we're supposed to relate to Jesus. You know that Jesus is like, somebody has it worse than you do. (laughs) Just suck it up. Drive on. What's wrong, buttercup? That's not what Jesus does. He actually sees that. He sees you in the same way that he sees his disciples. Like, hey, I see sorrow has filled your heart. I want you to also notice how the disciples kind of miss what Jesus is enduring, though. They're like, oh, Jesus, you're leaving. You're going away. What in the world are we going to do? And it causes them to miss this. Jesus is about to face something unimaginable to us and to them. And all that they can think about is how it's affecting them. Here's what I want you to think to consider. Don't let your pain and suffering blind you to the pain and suffering of people around you. Because what can happen, and and I think it's what's happening with the disciples, all they can think about is how Jesus' departure is going to affect them. Man, this is going to be terrible for us. Jesus, what's going on? And and they're not thinking about, like, Jesus is about to go through something himself. And here's what can happen in life. As we engage our own pain and suffering— that can be the only way we see the world, through how, what we're going through and how it's impacting us and how it's affecting us, and, and we just kind of ignore, like I've been there, you know, like my own suffering's so big in my view that I ignore like there's other people around here. And Jesus, though he's about to go through something way worse than what they're going to go through, he's still like, hey guys, I, I see that sorrow's filled your heart. Let me encourage you. Let me be with you, okay? All right, those were free. Let's get to the meat of the text. Okay, I want you to consider this question. Do you really believe Jesus? I mean, really believe him. And I I don't want you to be too quick to answer that because I think we're like, well, we're in church. I mean, we always, the answer to everything is God, Jesus, or their Bible, or yes. Like, what do you mean? We're, We're in church. Of course I believe Jesus. Well, I want you to remember John, he tells us at the end of his gospel why he's writing this gospel. And he says, I've written these things so that you would believe and in believing have eternal life. So John's saying with everything in his gospel, he's holding Jesus out to us and saying, I want you to believe in Jesus. 
So we've got to everywhere in the Gospel of John say, do I believe what Jesus is saying or what John is saying about Jesus? Now, here's why I ask this. Look at verses 5 through 7. Jesus says, I'm going away to him who sent me. Not one of you asked me where are you going, yet because I've spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Here's, the, here's why I think it's important to ask that question. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is to your benefit. It's for your benefit. It's better for you is what he's saying, that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the paraclete will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. Now, just a, a, a couple like helpful things as you're reading the Bible. When Jesus says, hey, I'm telling you the truth, or there's certain passages that say, truly I say unto you, um, that's not him. I, I think if we were honest when we're reading that, we would, it would make us say, was he, was he lying to me before? You know, like if I come to you and I'm like, hey, truly I say to you, you're going to be like, has the stuff you've said before not been truly? Or like, what, why, why are you saying that? When Jesus says that, it's not, hey, these things that I've said before weren't true or didn't matter. He's trying to draw our focus to something that's very, very important. This would be like um, if you have kids, you know those moments that you're like, hey, 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 eyes right here, eyes on me. And it's not that, like, don't pay attention to anything I say unless I'm, like, eyes here. It's just, like, this is important. I need your eyes on me. This is what Jesus is saying. It's like, hey, eyes right here. I tell you the truth. He says, if I don't go, the counselor won't come. And we need to ask, do we really believe Jesus when he says, it's to your benefit and to my benefit for Jesus to go? Because what Jesus, what Jesus is saying, J.D. Greer points this out, in, in, uh, he's got a book called Jesus Continued, and he's got this line about what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying is that the spirit inside of you is better than Jesus right beside you. That's what we're meant to say. Do we really believe that, that the spirit of God inside of you is better than Jesus physically right beside you? Because I think there's a lot of us who would be like, man, if I could just see the miracles of Jesus, if I could just see him multiply loaves and fish, then I'd have faith. If I could just see him rise Lazarus from the dead, then I'd believe in him. And, and Jesus would say, no. It's actually better for you if I go. There was countless people who saw Jesus do those things and they didn't all believe in him. The disciples who had been with him from the jump of his ministry in just a few hours are going to be like, when they're like, hey, weren't you with him? Peter's going to be like, no, I don't know him. What are you talking about? They had seen everything. So Jesus says, hey, no, 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 the spirit inside of you is better than Jesus right beside you. So we should ask the question, why? Why is it to their benefit and our benefit for Jesus to go? Because I think if we were honest, if we just had a poll and it was like, hey, two options for you right now. The Spirit of God can either be inside of you or Jesus can be right beside you your whole life. You're, I think we would be like, frankly, my brain is drawn to this one kind of quickly. I mean, to have Jesus right here who's like, mm, don't do that. Mm -mm. Just say it. Silence is, is better in this situation. Don't say that. Like, do this. Don't do this. Jesus right there, really? Is that better? So why is it better for Jesus to go and the counselor to come? Just two reasons. There's a lot of reasons. Let me just give you two. First, the plan of God is fulfilled through Jesus going. God's plan is fulfilled through Jesus going. The great question of the Old Testament is God makes these promises over and over and over again that he is going to dwell with his people. And his people, the nation of Israel at this time, like you and I, are a hot mess. I mean, you can't get through one page before you're like, oh my goodness, they love God and they're with God and they're worshiping God. And then the next page is like, why are you guys making an idol? Why You're bowing down to this thing that you made out of your earrings. And then, oh no, you're with God again. You love God. And then now you're thirsty and you're, you're complaining against God and saying it'd be better for us back in Egypt. And then it's like, oh, now you're with God again. And the next page is like, wait, you guys are sacrificing your children to another God. And the great question of the Old Testament is how is a holy and righteous God going to dwell with a unholy and unrighteous people without obliterating them? Like, how's all that going to work? 
And then in the Gospel of John, we see the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The redemptive plan of God would not happen if Jesus in this moment said, you know what, guys, I'm going to stay with you. I see sorrows filled your heart. I'm word, that cross thing, me going to the cross, rising from the dead, we're not going to do that. I'm going to be with you. Had that happened, you and I all might as well right now eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die and there's no hope, you know? Jesus had to go to the cross to fulfill the plan of God. A perfect, uh, a perfect man had to be sacrificed to cover the sins of imperfect humanity. God is perfect, righteous, holy, good. You and I are not. There's a gap between us, and in some way that gap had to be filled. In the plan of God, it's better for Jesus to go because in Jesus going to the cross, going to the grave, raising from the grave, going to the right hand of God the Father... The mystery that was veiled in the Old Testament is made clear. Oh, this is how. God himself is going to come rescue. Second reason why it's better for Jesus to go so that the counselor could come, the Holy Spirit. The presence of God is experienced through the counselor being sent. The presence of God is made personal to us through the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling inside those who would follow Jesus. I mean, if, if you th- we could talk about this forever, and I'm tempted to, um, but, I, uh, but I'm not going to, because I want to eat those beaver nuggets at some point. Um, the presence of Jesus, when he walked the earth, he was bound by time and space, which means Jesus could only be in one place at one time. So it's better for us, for, Jesus, for the Spirit to be inside of us, and that's all of us, then Jesus right beside us. Because if Jesus was right beside you physically, he could not be right beside me because Jesus had a physical human body, could only be in one place at one time. But because Jesus has gone to the right hand of God the Father, and the Father and the Son have sent the Spirit, what we believe is that the Spirit now indwells all those who would trust in Jesus for salvation, for grace, for forgiveness, for right standing before God. He's with all of us. That's part of the mystery of the gospel. Like, how does that work? I, I remember when I, was, when I was a little kid, somewhere around four or five. I mean, this, I think about this memory, and I'm like, I think this is why, one of the reasons why Jesus is like, you have to have childlike faith. Because I just remember really believing. Like, man, this is true. There's, there's desires and things in me that are warped and twisted. There's darkness in me. I wouldn't have had the words or language for all that, but I just was blown away that God would love me enough to come and to rescue me and then give me the promise that he lives inside of me. Like, I I just really believed that. And I believed it so much that I remember one morning I was eating oatmeal and having apple juice, and I had this freak out moment and told my mom, like, I I don't want to eat this anymore. And she was like, geez, here we go again, this kid. Why don't you want to eat your oatmeal? And I was like, I'm worried it's going to knock Jesus over. And I really, I was like, I don't know how this works, but Jesus lives inside of me, and if I eat oatmeal, I might knock him over, you know? That's like in a childlike way, learning to believe this reality that because Jesus went to the right hand of God the Father and sends his spirit, if you are in Christ, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, mysteriously, how it all works together, I don't know, I have a finite human brain, and his, he's, he's infinite, The Spirit of Jesus lives inside of us, and not just inside of you, but inside of me and inside of all Christians. So the presence of God has moved from a person now to a people. And so Jesus says, hey, it's to your benefit for me to go away so that that can happen, so that the counselor can come to everyone. He and the Father send the Spirit. And I think the next natural question is like, well, okay, what does the Spirit do? Jesus is like, hey, I see your heart's sorrowful because you think you're going to be left as orphans. You're going to be without people, but I'm actually going to send my spirit to you. And we should ask, like, what does the spirit do? This is why I say, like, if you have questions when you're reading the Bible, ask those questions. Yes, absolutely, but also keep reading. Because often those questions, when I'm like, well, wait a second, what does the spirit do? Jesus anticipates that. In verse 8, he says this. When he comes, the Spirit, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they don't believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So Jesus tells us 
Three things that the Spirit does around sin, conviction, and judgment. No, conviction, righteousness, and judgment. We'll get into those, but just a couple, like, things to notice about how Jesus talks. Like, do you notice Jesus doesn't tell us everything about the Holy Spirit here? Jesus often shows what is like frustrating restraint. So we're not going to, this is not going to be an exhaustive list of all that the Spirit does, because it's not what Jesus does here. He doesn't tell us everything the Spirit will do. We see in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and Ephesians 4 and and all throughout Acts, like what the Spirit does. So it's not exhaustive. He's going to hone in on three things. I want you to notice that the Spirit is a person, not an entity. Jesus says when he comes, not when it comes. <laughs> and I think like as we think of the Holy Spirit, we tend to just think it. We tend to think like Jesus, God the Son, yep, get that. I get that. He, God the Father, yep, he, God the Spirit, it. And, and Jesus says, no, no, when he comes. And this is one of the passages that we get the, that Christians have historically believed that there's one God who's eternally existed as three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. This is one of those passages. Jesus isn't like, hey, when it comes, this magical force that will be inside of you and in everything and all around. And it starts to sound very new agey. He's like, no, no, it's not, it's not an impersonal force. It's, it's a person. It's going to be with you, he. Last thing, this is a guarantee Jesus says when he comes. Not like, man, if he comes, or like, guys, I'm really hoping this all works. I'm really hoping me and the Father that we're still on the same page. Okay, we're good, right? I suffer, die, raise from the dead, come back to the right hand of God the Father. We send the Spirit. That's the plan. So he's like, no, no, guys, hey, when he comes. He knows they're sorrowful. He knows they're going to feel alone, abandoned, betrayed. And he's like, guys, I know you don't feel it right now. I know it's hard to wrap your heads around it, but I'm going to send the Spirit. And when he comes, this is what he's going to do. So what does the Spirit do? Jesus tells us three things. First, the Spirit brings conviction of sin and invites people to repentance. The Spirit of God brings personal conviction of sin and invites people to repentance. Look what he says in verse 8. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they don't believe in me. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is convict people personally. Uh, Like, there is something that happens in those who follow Jesus, who legitimately trust in Jesus, where they say, there's not just brokenness in the world, there's not just twisted and warped desires, there's not just things that are wrong in the world, there's things that are wrong in me. So it's not just I look out there and I'm like, what's wrong with the world and CNN and Fox News and all the, everything's broken and wrong and twisted. There comes a moment where you come to grips with, wait a second, there's something in me that's wrong. There's desires that I have that are warped and twisted. And what Jesus says is, I'm going to bring the Spirit to bring conviction of that, to bring personal conviction. Because Jesus says in John 8, 24, he says, hey, if you don't believe that I am he, I'm no, I am who I say that I am, you're going to die in your sins. So for us not to die in our sins and to believe in Jesus, we need to be convicted that we have sins. And when we think of sins, like we did an entire series on this, I think it was earlier this year, called Make War. So you can go listen to those because we did a deep dive into like what is sin and what does Jesus do with sin and how do we fight and kill sin and, and all of that. But I think when we think sin, we think primarily law-breaking. Whether or not you believe sin is a thing or whatever, we think primarily law-breaking, that God is this deity, that he's got this list of rules, and and sin is breaking those rules, or, uh, or, you know, kind of it's it's not doing what, what God commands or doing things that God says not to do these things. And that's true, but it's more than that. Because when the Bible talks about sin, it's not less than rule breaking, but it's, it's more than just rule keeping to not sin. So the Bible talks about sin like missing the mark, you know? So um, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if you think of the glory of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God as this standard, as this target, you know? 
we tend to think of sin like, man, I'm, I'm aiming at the target and just sometimes I miss. We, we really should think archery with this. It's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming at the target and I know some of y'all are like, you don't, you don't, that's like, you don't, you don't do archery, I can tell, okay? Hang with me. I'm aiming at the target, but I miss. What the Bible is going to say is the problem isn't just that we miss the target of God's holiness and righteousness, it's that we don't even aim at it. That without conviction of sin, we're not aiming at the holiness of God. It's like us taking the arrow and the target's there. And we're over here like, no, there's other things I want to shoot at. And I want to try it off this way. No, man. We, we, like, we've all sinned, fall short of the glory of God. And what Jesus says is that the Holy Spirit is going to bring conviction of that personally. That there's a moment where you're going to realize, no, no, no. I sin against God. I have brokenness in me that I can't fix on my own. Now... It's important to remember, the Spirit of God is the one who brings conviction, not you. The Spirit brings conviction, not you. It's the Spirit's role, not yours. And that's both, both incredibly freeing, because it means as a parent, as a spouse, as an employee, as an employer, like it's not your role to personally convict people. But it's also difficult because it means you don't have control. <laughs> So it's like good in one sense because it's like, oh, the weight's not on me. And it's tough in another sense because you're like, that means I don't have control. I, I can't control whether or not someone is convicted of their sin. Your role, Jesus is saying, hey, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're going to testify to me. You're going to tell the truth about who I am and what I've done. Your role is to testify about who Jesus is and what he's done in your life. And the spirit will do the rest. And amazingly, the spirit often uses us. I mean, it's just these moments. I, I have these type of moments where someone will experience personal conviction, and they're like, man, I, I believe in Jesus now. And in some ways, I'm like, we've been talking about this for a long time. Why did it just get through now? Or, or it's the thing where, you know, like I've done this with my parents plenty of times, Lord knows, but like where I hear something from someone other than my parents, the same thing that my parents told me over and over and over again growing up, and I come back like, can you believe this? And they're like, you've got to be kidding me, man. I've been telling you that over and over. The same thing can happen that you're like, man, I, I've been praying for you. I've been sharing the good news of Jesus. What changed now? The Holy Spirit brought conviction of sin. This is what happens in Acts 2 when Peter, the same guy who's about to deny Jesus, he is radically changed by the gospel of Jesus. He has an encounter with the risen Jesus. His life is changed. He goes from a coward to someone in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit comes. He's filled with the Spirit. And he begins to tell those who killed Jesus, you killed Jesus. You killed the author of life. But that was the plan of God from the beginning so that salvation could actually come. And here's what happens. The people hear this. The same people who just a month or two earlier, had put Jesus on the cross. They hear this message, same message that Jesus had been preaching to them. This time there's conviction from the Spirit. Acts 2 says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? There's conviction, and they're like, okay, what do we do? We experience our brokenness, our sin against God. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin and draws us to repentance. Repentance is turning from sin and turning to Jesus. It's saying these warped, twisted, broken, sinful desires that I have that are against God. I can't deal with those on my own. Repentance is I'm turning away from those things and I'm turning to Jesus and saying, Jesus, save. The Spirit brings conviction of sin and invites people to repentance. But the Spirit also shows where true righteousness comes from. It's like, hey, conviction of sin, the Spirit also shows where true righteousness comes from. And this is what Jesus tells us. Look again at verse 8. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they don't believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. What the Spirit does is convicts of sin, draws to repentance, but also shows the moral bankruptcy of the world. They're like all the ways that the world tries to deal with the brokenness in it, they don't work. They don't work. 
I mean, for all of human history, they haven't worked. And, and when, G- when Jesus says, hey, the Spirit's going to bring conviction about righteousness because I'm going to the Father. When Jesus went to the Father, he showed us the path to righteousness. And the path to righteousness isn't one that we walk ourselves. It's not Jesus saying, here's all that you do to make yourself right with God. That is what every other religion and worldview in the world tries to answer. How do you deal with the brokenness of the world, the brokenness in yourself? And it's either the worldview is just, you just have to accept yourself. You just have to be the true version of yourself. And that doesn't work because at the end of the day, you know you. And you're like, I, I don't like this me. And no matter how much I try to be like, well, I just, I'm, I'm a good person and I'm better than that person. It doesn't work. Or religions say, here's the path to make yourself right with God or to become a God yourself. And Christianity says, hey, guys, the path to righteousness isn't a path at all. It's a gap that cannot be breached. Because on one hand, you have sinful, warped, twisted you and I, broken desires, chasing sin, rejecting God. And on the other side, you have God who's holy and perfect and just. And the Bible's going to say over and over, our attempts at righteousness Living good enough to just make God pleased with us, they just don't work. But what we see in the life of Jesus and what the Holy Spirit makes real to us personally is what Jesus did is he blazed that gap himself. He becomes our righteousness. He goes to the cross, suffers what we were meant to suffer, though he's perfectly righteous. And at the cross, the righteousness of Jesus is given to you and I, though we are perfectly sinful. The great exchange happens. And what the Spirit makes real to us is understanding that the only way to true righteousness, the only, and when we say righteousness, I I don't want to assume that we all know what that means. Righteousness means right standing with God. It means being in the presence of God and, and God saying, you and I, we're good. We're on good terms. And what the Spirit makes real to us through the word of Jesus is that the only way to right standing with God is through Jesus going to the cross for sinful humanity, you and I. Suffering and dying in our place. It's through Jesus rising up from the grave and then going to the right hand of God the Father for you and I. And this is what would make Paul in Philippians 3 say, he says, all the things that I counted as righteousness, man, I was from the right family, right lineage. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, zealous, persecuting Christians. All of that stuff. I actually now count as lost because it all got in the way of me actually knowing Christ. And he says, my desire is to be found in Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. It's the spirit who not just brings conviction of sin, draws us to repentance, but actually shows us that our only hope to stand before God perfectly righteous is a righteousness that comes from outside of ourselves. And that's what Jesus purchases as he suffers and dies in our place. The Spirit shows us where true righteousness comes from. And hey, it is not through you and I getting it right. It's through you and I in the midst of our brokenness and sin saying, Jesus, save. I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It's enough that Christ died and that he died for me. Third, the Spirit warns and encourages us of the coming judgment. So Jesus says when the Spirit comes, he's going to convict the world about sin, righteousness, third, judgment. About sin because they don't believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, and here's a specific way he talks about it, because the ruler of this world has been judged. What he means is, because of what Jesus has done, there is judgment that is coming to those who would reject Jesus. And we know that because judgment came to the enemy of Jesus, Satan. So at the cross of Christ, Satan thinks he's one. Satan thinks, it worked. My plan worked. Look at you hanging on the cross. On Sunday morning, Jesus just flips that and reverses it. And is like, nope, didn't work. Your plan didn't work. We learn through Jesus, the Spirit applies this. The enemy is a liar and his plan does not work. Jesus has sent the Spirit to bring conviction of sin, to draw us to repentance to show us that true righteousness comes through Jesus going to the Father. 
and that there is coming judgment. And so let me, just, let me just end with a couple of encouragements here, or desires. Because I just think about who I want us to be as a people. Hey, let's be desperate for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in this church. Because in some ways, I know we want to live like there are things that we can control. And we got the notes ready, and we're like, you just show me how I can control. How can I guarantee that my kids are going to grow up loving Jesus and everything's going to be fine? How can I guarantee that my spouse will love Jesus? How can I guarantee that my neighbors, I just need to get the formula right. What do I do? And what Jesus says is, testify to the good news of what I've done. Tell people often of who I am and what I've done for you. And then beg that the Spirit will show up and bring life to that message. It's the Spirit's role to bring conviction. So if it's the Spirit of God who does these things, not us, what we need to do is beg the Spirit to do those things. Beg the Spirit to bring personal conviction of sin, continued conviction of sin in our own lives and in the lives of our neighbors and our, or the people we work with, the people we go to, gym, to the gym with. Like, let's be desperate for the Holy Spirit to work. I just am not interested at all in having a church that people show up and they're like, man, those guys are killing it. They're just doing such a great job. It's amazing the way they do worship and the way that God preaches and like all that stuff. I'm not interested in that at all. What I'm really interested in is people saying, I don't know why, but I'm drawn to that people. I don't know why, but I go in there. And, I've, and, and I, I'm like, man, I, like I, I'm experiencing conviction. What is this? All of a sudden, these things that I believed are true for people in general. I, I now I think I believe them. I, I've had, I, I had this interaction a while back with a guy who was like, we were talking, and he had been coming to the church and, and was not a Christian. And he said, we had this interaction, and there, there was a lot. He's very cerebral, you know, very like, uh, I need to understand this fully with my mind. We had this one interaction where he was like, I think I believe this. I don't know why. Like, no, It's not like I've found a better argument for why this is cognitively true. I just think I believe that. Why is it? And I'm like, Holy Spirit, thank you. You've done what you've done, what you can do. You're bringing personal conviction, helping somebody personally realize this is not just true in a general sense. It's true for me. Only the Spirit can do that. So let's be desperate for his work in our lives and in this church. And let's give up trying to be the Holy Spirit ourselves. Because we just do, man. We'll, we'll take verses like, you know, in Proverbs where it's, let me, so let me just talk to parents for a while. We'll take verses like in Proverbs where it says, hey, if you, if you train up a child in the way they should go, they won't depart from it when they're older. Well, we, we have to read the Bible literarily, and Proverbs are truisms. When the Proverbs are written, it's like, hey, in general, if you do this, you can expect this. But I would just venture to get, if you got young kids in here, go around to some of our seasoned saints and say, hey, as a parent, did you do everything right and everything worked out? Because some people are going to be like, man, I did everything wrong and my kids love Jesus and I have, no, I, have, I, have, I have no reason why I believe. How in the world did that happen? I did everything wrong as a, as a parent. And they believe Jesus, man. It's the Holy Spirit's brought conviction, convicted them in righteousness. You're also going to encounter parents who are going to say, in general, I did everything right. And I have a child who doesn't love Jesus. Hey, we got to give up trying to be the Holy Spirit because what your spouse who doesn't love Jesus, what your child who doesn't love Jesus, what your family member who doesn't love Jesus, what they need is a righteousness from outside themselves. What my kids don't need is for me to perfectly create a structure that is like, if I do all this perfectly, then they're going to love Jesus. If that would be true, there's no need for Jesus because it means we can fulfill the law so perfectly that we don't actually need Jesus. My kids need exactly what I need, and that's a righteousness outside of myself and outside of themselves. They need to come to a personal conviction that they have sinned against a holy and righteous God. And that because of that, they deserve punishment. God is perfectly just. And the punishment against an eternal God is eternal punishment. It's eternal judgment. 
but that that God loves them so ferociously and so perfectly that he would send his son to suffer that judgment in their place, that they might, through faith in the finished work of Christ, be declared perfectly righteous, forgiven of their sins, adopted into the family of God. I can't lay out a rational enough argument for that that everyone's going to believe. The only answer I have for why anyone believes any of that is the Holy Spirit doing what Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would do, bringing personal conviction of sin, drawing people to repentance, showing them the path to true righteousness is outside of themselves. It's Jesus being perfectly righteous in their place. So let's give up trying to be the Holy Spirit. Hey, let's stand together. I want to invite those who are serving communion to come down front. (laughs) There's this passage in Revelation 12. Like one of the things I'm just so eager for myself and for us to know is like, if it's true, And I believe it's true because Jesus said it's true. If it's true that the same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you, it means you are not alone and you're not powerless. And so this meal that we celebrate is a meal of victory. Revelation 12, 11 talks about how we defeat the lamb through, we defeat the enemy through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. What that means is the enemy of God and our enemy is defeated through the blood that Jesus shed. I mean, the the enemy wants to say, there is no way. God cannot be for you. You cannot be with God. You're not righteous. You don't deserve to be with God. And the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. It says that is all true, but I have been covered with a righteousness that is not my own. I am clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. And that's what we remember and declare as we come to this table. And it's a meal of victory. There's a day coming where we'll raise this cup to the lamb who was slain. And we'll say, this is a meal of victory. The enemy's plan did not work. And so I want to encourage you to remember that. And it didn't, it's not that it didn't work because you were like, oh, surprise, I can be righteous enough on my own. The enemy thought I couldn't. No, he's right. You can't be righteous enough on your own. The reason it worked is because Jesus said, I'm going to be righteous in your place. I'm going to suffer and die in your place. I'm going to rise for your victory. And that's what we, we celebrate as we come to this table Hey, and I want to encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are welcome at this table. And maybe you pray as you come forward, Spirit, would you testify to me as I take this meal that I am a child of God, that I have been forgiven, that I am righteous, and it's not my own righteousness, it's my older brother in King Jesus who has given me his righteousness. So let's take this as a prophetic declaration against the powers of darkness that we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. And let's pray that the same spirit that convicted us of sin and drew us to faith in Jesus and showed us the righteousness of Jesus, that he would do it over and over and over again in the lives of those we love, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our places of work. Friends, when you're ready, come and feast.